Well, good morning. I don't know what you came to do. I like that. That's pretty good. Anyway, uh, please be taking out your Bibles. And uh, let's be turning to Mark chapter 9. And uh, today, instead of having a normal service, I'm actually doing what's called a communion. So we're not going to have a communion. My sermon will be the communion. And uh, one quick announcement I did uh, forget is that uh, this past week, miraculously, Uncle Louie was baptized up there in Father, and of course he got baptized. So, if you ever have to miss a deed time to baptize one of your parents, that's totally acceptable. And allowed. Mark chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up in verse 2. Bible says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves to be alone. He was transfigured in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling. Extremely white as no launder on earth could white them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, since they were terrified. A cloud appeared overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with him except Jesus. As they're coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen, and that the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. They kept this word to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Then they asked him, Why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah does come first, he restores all things, he replied. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did whatever they pleased to him, just and is written about him. I want you to imagine today that you were with Jesus up on the mountain. And the Bible says that as he goes up to the mountain, it's Peter, James, and John, this was the inner circle of Jesus, as they walk up to the mountain, all of a sudden a cloud comes, and what appears amongst them is no longer just Jesus, but Moses and Elijah. Yeah. These were two men that had died and were alive. Why were they terrified? Well, if someone you had heard about rose from the dead and was talking to one of your friends, you would freak out too. Peter doesn't know what to say. So he begins just talking. You guys have any friends like that? Yes. When they get scared and they don't know what to say, maybe their biggest fear is silence, and they start just saying stuff. So Peter goes, well, maybe we ought to build some shelters for the three of you. I can build you on Moses, and you on Elijah, and you on Jesus. Of course, Jesus, I'm sure, told Peter to be quiet. <laughs> Your job is not here to be here to talk, but rather to listen. And uh, of course, that's what happens. Well, there's a couple of, of things in this passage that are quite incredible. Number one is we understand that this was the culmination of Moses, which was the law in the Old Testament. You and I, uh, Elijah, who was the prophet. Of course, that's what makes up the Old Testament. But now you add Jesus, known also as the word of God that had come and together had brought God's word to the people. Peter's watching and, and he says something weird, but I think actually there's something more to it. I think Peter was experiencing something incredible up on the mountain. He saw Jesus, but he was with two other resurrected men of God, and 
I believe what he was thinking was simple. I want to stay here. <laughs> Let's build a shelter so we can hang out here until I pass away. And Jesus goes, no. We sadly have to go back down the mountain and back in to the world. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had a mountaintop experience with God. Maybe you've had like an incredible time with God where you've been praying, pouring your heart out. Maybe it's just been reading the Bible. And you felt so close to God, so pure and so good, but you knew at some point your quiet time had to end. Yeah. And you knew that you had to go to work, you had to go to school, and you just dreaded the possibility of what was going to happen to you. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> what did John say? When you give, you get more back. I didn't get more back, but I had one out too. There's an analogy in there somewhere, but anyway. <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced it, but I think that's what was happening with Moses. Here's the reality. Even today, no matter how much you enjoy this worship service, at some point we're going to leave and go back into the real world. You see, we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. And that is the title of today's message. Point number one, amongst the powerless, but of the powerful. In verse 14, the Bible goes on. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Some from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. He replied to them, You unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times he's thrown into the fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. She said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father boy cried, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was quickly gathered, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out shrieking and throwing him into a terrible convulsion. The boy became like a corpse, so many they said, He is dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him up and stood up. After he had gone to the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, This kind can only come out through prayer. You know, very interesting, as Jesus, Peter, James, and John are walking down that hill, down that mountain. The first thing they see is the disciples whom they left arguing with the other religious men of that day. The reason why is that the disciples without Jesus had displayed a level of powerlessness over an evil spirit. And the Bible says that that opened up the critics of God who were already mocking Jesus and his disciples, and it opened up those disciples to their criticism. You know, very often in our lives, when we are in a powerless state, and yet claim to be walking with the God of all power, it too can open up us for criticism. Now we know that right now in our world, we live in a powerless world. Most religion and most uh, ideas of Christianity or religion produce a powerlessness in the lives of the people that attack. 
number of years ago, I read a story about a woman. And a woman was in her car, and as she was driving, she was driving and someone cut her off. You ever been cut off before yeah. on the roads? And this woman became so incensed and so angry. She rolled down her window, she put her finger out of the window. You know which finger I'm talking about. <laughs> And then, to her dismay, not only did that car cut her off, but the car in front of her stopped. She begins honking the horn, and the car doesn't move. Well, she looks back in the rear view, and there were sirens that were going off. A police officer pulls her over and asks her to get out of the car. She gets out of the car, to her surprise, she was arrested, and she was put in jail. Not knowing what she had done, she sat there contemplating what exactly went wrong. And then all of a sudden, the police officer came in and was so apologetic. He goes, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I made a horrible mistake. You see, when I pulled up behind you yesterday, I saw on your bumper sticker there was a, the Christian fish. And then I saw you stick your finger out of the window and I got confused. <laughs> And then on the, the right side of your bumper, I saw a sticker that said, what would Jesus do? And I thought that the only possible explanation for what was happening is that you stole the car. But I checked all of our databases. That is your car. I'm so sorry. And of course, the woman didn't laugh. You know, I think for some of us, we relate to this story. Because we know that we've got the right doctrine. We know that we're baptized and we've got the Holy Spirit. And yet, in our life, there's a level of powerlessness that has entered us, and we don't know what's wrong. Well, Jesus comes, he casts the demon out, and the disciples pull him aside. They go, teacher, why were you able to cast it out, but we could not? Now, what he says has meaning, and yet very often people miss his point. He says, this one comes out only through prayer. But did you miss the fact that he didn't pray it out? So what was he talking about? You see, Jesus had already given them authority over the demons. There was never a command to pray out the demons. So what was he talking about? Simply this. They had been given power by God, but they had not maintained it through prayer. And as a result, when the time came, when they contacted and were confronted by demons, they did not have the power to cast them out. You know, I think very often for us as Christians, we understand and know that we were given power by God. We're given the power through the Holy Spirit to live the upright life, to be in a world of powerlessness and to display power, and yet we sit here today, and for some of us, that power is God. The reason why is you have not maintained it through prayer. You know, believe it or not, there was a day where I could dunk. Now there is a rumor that white guys can't jump. This rumor is absolutely true. And yet, when I was younger, I defied this truth. There's a number of dunk contests that I entered. I've never lost a dunk contest in my life. Now, if you're asking me to dunk now, no way. I probably couldn't jump over a piece of paper on the ground. You might wonder why. Well, I did have knee surgery, but a lot of people in the NBA have the same surgery and they come back fine. The reason I can't jump now is that I had a power, but I did not maintain it. I stopped lifting.
weights, I stopped running, I started lifting the floor, and all of a sudden, my power was gone. And it wasn't that long ago. If you're sitting here this morning wondering what happened to your Christian power, why is it so hard to not fall in the sand? Why is it so hard to get here this morning? Why did it take so long to get dressed? Why did I have to contemplate whether I was even coming or not? It's because you have not maintained the power that God gave you. And I'm going to tell you, all that is separating you from that power is prayer. Get back into the Bible. Talk back to the God of all power. And you will not only be among the powerful, but you will have the power yourself. Wow. Let's go back to verse 30. The Bible says that they left that place and made their way through Galilee, but they did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he's killed, they will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Here is one of the multiple times in the Bible where Jesus tells his disciples, very plainly, I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, and I'll rise again in three days. What's funny is, as clear as Jesus is, he says it plainly over and over and over again. And yet, they did not understand him. Why? Because he was telling them something they did not want to understand. Now, if you're a parent, you know that this is true. I can come into my house, and I've got a pretty small condo right now. And I can go, hey, Connor, can you go and take out the cat or feed the cat? And Connor can't hear me. I can walk in and go, hey, Brad, can you vacuum the carpet? The most common response from all of my children when asking something they don't want to do is, huh? <laughs> they can't hear me. Now, the irony of it is I can walk into the house with dinner. I can walk in with uh, ice cream or a popsicle. And I can whisper. I have ice cream. <laughs> And from the four corners of my house, my children are there. It's like a miracle. What's interesting here, though, is Jesus is trying to teach them what he's all about. And it's something they did not want to understand. What was he trying to teach them? Selflessness. Let's see what they were arguing about. Verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. Because on the way, they've been arguing with one another about who is the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He took a child and had him sit amongst them, and taking his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one little child such as this, in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. As Jesus was predicting his death, the disciples were arguing on the way about who would be the greatest. Point number two. Among the selfish, but of those that are selfless. You know, I think very interesting here, Jesus taught them that the heart of Christianity was selflessness. Right. You understand that we serve a God, a God that emptied himself of his power. He came on the earth, did not live in riches, did not come as a king, but emptied his power to be like us, that he 
he might win us. A number of years ago, I was trying to find a cool Christmas present for Brad. And at that time, Connor and, and Bree were not born yet. I started thinking of, a, of an animal that I could buy that wouldn't take too much effort to keep alive. <laughs> and I thought about it, you know what? I think buying a pet fish would be perfect. So I bought a little aquarium and I bought two fish. I put them in the tank, Brett was excited, the next day I wake up and they're both floating upside down. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, these were fighting fish. One of them bit the other one, then killed that one, and he died by eating too much of the other one. Well, then I had to have a funeral for the fish. Now, if you've ever been to a fish funeral, they're pretty quick. I said a prayer. We said goodbye and we flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> but then I went back into the, the, the pet store. I said, okay, I need another fish. So I bought this cute little goldfish. Two days later, floating upside down. And I'm following the directions, mind you. So I take it back and I say, lady, you gotta help me, please. I've had two fish funerals in four days. <laughs> My kid has cried twice. I need something I can't kill. She said, no problem. She said, buy these two goldfish. I bought these, they're a little bit bigger. She goes, you can't kill these even if you try. I go, fantastic. <laughs> and she was right. I start feeding the fish. Now, believe it or not, fish are not as easy as it sounds. They do a little bit of pooping in the tank, and then you gotta clean the tank. And then they start to grow. So these two fish started growing quickly, and then all of a sudden I went from a tank that I had to clean like every other day, I had to buy a new tank. And anyway, it was an exhausting, exhausting effort to keep these fish alive. Well, I started kind of giving a bad attitude towards the fish. I started thinking, I go, you know, what am I getting out of this? I just feed these guys, I clean their poop, and I can't even pet these things. So I got like this, this ingenious idea. I said, maybe I can pet them. They should know by now I've got good intentions. This is a true story, actually. So I put my hand in the tank and I try to pet them. And I tried to move my hand really slowly, but it didn't work. It freaked them out. They just started going crazy in the tank. And I would try, I tried for about three days to try everything, thinking that surely these fish that I've done nothing but feed and care for would know that my intentions are only good, and yet they did not know. But then I began thinking about God. I said, isn't this what happens with us and God? Wow. How then would I get this fish to know my intentions were good? Well, the reality is simple. I would have to become a fish to tell the fish my intentions. That is the story of God. When he spoke from the mouth and the Bible said that they were so terrified, they begged Moses to speak instead. Stand to this day, people go, man, the God of the Old Testament's a mean God. And yet in Hebrews it says that Jesus is the exact representation of God. Anything you want to know about God, you just look at the life of Jesus. And that is God. We serve a God that was willing to do anything that you and I would have a chance at salvation. And yet so often, instead of imitating that selflessness, we, like the other disciples, are arguing about things of this world. About who's the greatest. Isn't this a worldly argument? Do you know that it actually is a sin to want to be the greatest? What do you mean? In order to be the greatest, you have to push other people down. 
It's kind of funny. I uh, love basketball. And every year when the finals, the, the, the playoffs come, it's always an argument. Who's the greatest basketball player ever? Who's the GOAT? Greatest of all time. This has made its way in the NASCAR and the golf and to every sport. Why? Because everyone is obsessed with who's the greatest. And what's funny is anyone who's got half a brain goes, you can't compare people. LeBron is great, but so is Michael. So is Kobe. So is Shaq. So was Tiger. So was Gretzky. And you kind of go down the line. We can actually all be great, and if you're okay with that, then no one has to be the greatest. And you have room in your heart for all to be great. But that takes selflessness to do that. Well, Jesus wanted to help them understand what Christianity was all about. He has some of the children come to him. He says, come sit here. Whoever welcomes one of these, welcomes me. You know, uh, for some of us who are single, we're looking forward to a day, I think, that we get married. For some of you, maybe not. But this illustration, you'll get totally done. It's kind of funny, what happens when you're single is you do what you want, when you want, and you don't answer to nobody. It's actually pretty fantastic. <laughs> and when you get married, you think that that's going to go on unimpeded. But it stops. Usually about the second or third day of marriage, the guy goes, okay, honey, I'm going to go and work out. And she goes, no, you're not. <laughs> and the guy goes, well, but, but sure I am. I mean, it's Tuesday. I've been working out Tuesday morning for the last four years. And she goes, well, things are different now. <laughs> and then you, you go to bed one night and, and uh, i got to be careful, I don't get trouble. You go to bed one night and, and then your wife could, could lean over. Maybe it's the husband leans over in bed and goes, goes, hey. This is like 1 a.m. in the morning. It would be great if you got me a cup of water. <laughs> Now, this wasn't in your plans. You would lay down with full intention of going to sleep. And now she's proposed that you get up. Rather than sleeping, get up. You walk into the kitchen. You fill up the glass with water. And possibly you might not do it right. You might have missed an ice cube or maybe she wanted hot water. You fully grasp that this could happen. Yeah. And then you've got to come back and you give the cup. <laughs> we related it all? <laughs> and we all know that if you want to stay married, there's a bit of selflessness that it takes. The proper answer in that scenario should be, sure, I'd love to. <laughs> Most of us do half, right? <laughs> And we go, we, we, we sort of do it, and we start making weird noises. And most guys, we're good at this, we go. All right. And then we walk, and we get the water, and we go. And then we give it back. What you see in reality, as much selflessness as that takes, you can always say no. When you have a child, totally different. When that child starts to cry and that child is calling you, there is not a negotiation, a deliberation. You either get the child or the child eventually dies. That child can do nothing for you for the first great number of years of its life. It cries, you pick it up. It cries, you feed it. It poops, you clean it. No negotiation. And Jesus goes, if you want to know what Christianity is supposed to be like, it 
It's like a child that you welcome. You see, Christianity is not about what you can get out of it. It's actually about what you give to God, expecting nothing in return. Come on, bro. I'm going to ask you today, is that where your heart's at this morning? Does it excite you, the possibility of, of serving someone? Does it excite you about maybe studying with the Bible with someone? And with all of that, with the probability of getting absolutely nothing in return, if so, then you understand what Christianity is all about. I think some of us have begun to ask the question, what sin is for me? Of course, the old joke is, you could also phrase it, what's sin it for me? Because Christianity is not about you. It's about God. In verse 38, it says, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Don't stop him, said Jesus. Because there is no one who perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil to me. For whoever is against us is for us. And whoever gives you a cup of water and drink in my name because you belong to Christ, truly I tell them, he will never lose his reward. You know, I think right here there's an amazing principle in this passage that we need to grasp here this morning. You see, very often we don't like it when people do things that we have not authorized. And if you're a leader, you might have a little bit of that in your genetics. If you're a parent, maybe that too. But right here, the issue that Jesus was pointing out is they were not fixated on what they were teaching, what they were doing, but rather who was doing it. And the fact that they had not told them or gave them permission to do it. And Jesus goes, leave them alone. What are you doing? You know, I uh, think that we have an incredible church. Yeah. And if you're not quite sure what you've come to today, this is what's called a restoration movement. The idea is, is as we look around the world, we say, well, when we look at the Bible and we see the description of God's church, and we look around to the many churches that many of us have attended, we see a great chasm between what we read and what we see. And a restoration movement is a church that goes, hey, we don't have to refigure out anything. I've been to churches where they're trying to figure it out. Well, I think the reason why the book of Acts is so foreign to us is it must be the lighting in the church. We dim the lights so we had brighter light and people would be more excited. Some might say, well, well, we need a smoke machine. Certainly Jesus, when he walked out, maybe had a smoke machine. Some go, no, it's, it's the singing. We're singing hymns from 1800s. We need more modernized music. We say none of that matters. The issue of why there's a chasm between what you see in church and the Bible is that there's been a drifting, a great drifting from the scriptures. It is not our job to reinvent the wheel. It is our job to simply get back to the word of God and to obey it. And we're inviting people to join us and to help us to evangelize the world in our day. That being said, we're not focused on who. Our job is not to go around and say bad things about every other church. Our job is to focus on what's right. Yes. Now, when you know what's right, you can determine who's right. But the issue is not about a particular group having a monopoly on the truth. It's about us striving to follow the word of God. And having a humility that that's what it is about. 
the greater good. Not just us, but the greater good. You know, I think that uh, this morning, I don't know how you woke up, but I was excited. Why? Because it's Sunday. Yeah. You know what happened on Sunday many years ago? Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Yeah. Do you know why we're here this morning? Because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Yeah. And now that we know that, I think that there were some of us who came in this morning and we not only understood that, but we were ready, ready to celebrate it. There's others that we came and we're not even sure why we came. We maybe stumbled in, we're frustrated at our wife or our husband who made us late. Or maybe we came in and we're flustered about something that happened in the week. Remember, Christianity is not about you. And I think just to challenge our super region here, on Sunday morning, it is a time where we cast off whatever we're going through. Yeah. And we go, you know what? I might be going through some financial problems, maybe some marital problems, but right now, this is not about me. This is about the God that we worship. And we are here to worship God. When the singing starts, no matter how good of a conversation you're having, out of a reverence for God, you stop and you begin singing to your God. What that means is when church is at 10 o'clock, we come in and we go, you know what? Usually when I go to class, I go to work, I get there just right on time. But this is far more important than that. This is... Time to worship God. Come on, brother. Not only should I be there on time, I should be there early. Why? Do you know that there are people that are here today that are actually contemplating walking away from God? Yeah. How do I know that? Because there's always people contemplating that. Yeah. yeah. And the Bible teaches that we can encourage one another. On. The word encourage means to instill, to input courage into someone else. How is that done? That's done in the fellowship. Do you realize that today, a conversation you could have had before church even began, maybe during the fellowship break, may have given someone the courage to stay faithful to God. Great. Isn't that what church is in part for? Yeah. And so if we're not coming on time, we've missed an incredible opportunity to be used by God. And I pray that from here on forward, we can live in a world of people that are selfish, but let's be among those that are selfless. Amen? <laughs> My third and final point is amongst the fearful, but of those that are faithful. In verse 42, this will be the last text that I read. It says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it'd be better for him if a heavy millstone was hung around his neck and if you're thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to enter like men than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to deliver, enter life Lame and have two feet be thrown into hell. Yeah. And if your eye cause you to fall away, gouge it out. It is better to be into the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes be thrown into hell. Uh -huh. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Forever will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt should lose its flavor, how will you season it again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. You know, right here in this passage, Jesus lays out one of the most hardline passages in the Bible. He said, hey, if you cause others to sin, it actually would be better for you to get a giant stone, create a necklace and hang it around your neck and jump into the ocean and drown yourself. It would be better for you 
than to continue to live in that way. That's pretty radical. Yeah. Now, if you're like me, you're a little guilty of this. I spent my entire high school and two years of college trying to get anyone who hadn't said to say. I was at a party, and if you told me you never got drunk before, that became my mission. If I was at a party and told me you hadn't got high before, that was my mission. If you were a guy that dared say that you were a virgin by the time you were 16, where I grew up, you'd be ridiculed and mocked. That's how I grew up. By the time I came and studied the Bible, I had not one but many millstones tied around my neck. And yet we understand with God there is mercy and there is forgiveness. The Bible says when God forgives your sin, he forgets it. And all those millstones were taken away. But then he goes on, he goes into the text here, and he says, hey, you've got to get radical when it comes to repentance. Yeah. Now, we understand that this is not literal. If your hand has caused you to steal, he's not saying literally chop it off. We've got to say that because we don't want to get sued. <laughs> But secondly, if you were to look around, if that was true, it was literal, this would be the fellowship of the blind and maimed. Could you imagine? Our body parts would be severed most of them. So the good news is it's not literal, but what he's talking about is being radical. He says if something causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For some of us, we've been studying the Bible, and there is sin in our lives that we're just hanging on to. But you don't know what I've got to give up. I love this sin. It's incredible. I enjoy it. No, I do know exactly what you're talking about. I actually walked away from God the first time I studied the Bible because I was in love with my sin. I loved it. I didn't want to give it up. I kind of envisioned the life of Christianity of being kind of a campus dork. I was a basketball player. People thought I was cool. I cared so much about that. I love the feeling of being drunk. I loved it. I love when someone came at me, I could fight with them. Grew up in Wyatt's house. <laughs> I loved it. And yet, as I denied and declined my relationship with God and chose to sin and went on my way, I began to hate the very sins that I loved. And luckily God kept working in my life where by the time I came to my senses, I had tried to stop drinking. I had tried to stop fighting. I knew these things were bad. And yet, I felt trapped. What once made, gave me joy had now given me grief. And I finally understood that God doesn't just make up rules in the Bible to wreck our lives. Some of us were like that. Oh, the Bible, gosh, it says that in the scriptures. How awful it would be if my life was like that. God has made his word and he has created his word not to wreck your life, but to give you life. Yes. If you continue on the path of sin, trust me, you will understand why God issued these rules to begin with. Yeah. And I really want to challenge you today. If you're studying the Bible and you haven't repented, what are you waiting for? Maybe you've gone right with God, and as the Bible says, you've gone back to your vomit. You're back into the world and you're enjoying sin and maybe you haven't even told anyone about it. The Bible said, hey, do you understand what's at stake? The Bible's saying here that you've got to get radical because your eternity is on the line. Now, I read a story a number of years ago about a man who was working on an aircraft and as they took off, there was a weird sound that was coming from the door. And as he went to go and check out this weird sound that was sounding by the door, he walked over and the airplane door that he thought was shut actually swung open. 
And this man was whisked out the airplane door. Everyone on the plane figured that he was dead. But they needed to make an emergency landing. This is a real story, by the way. I didn't make it up. And as they landed that plane, what they saw next shocked them. The man that had been whisked out of that door was not only still alive, he had grabbed on to a piece of metal near the door as he had been swung out, and he held on to it with one hand. Whoa. Uh -oh. For 20 minutes, and negative 20 degree weather, his hand had frozen to that piece of metal. And I believe his arm probably dislocated in that world. And it was such a shock that what happened was, is the paramedics were telling to him, they came and they said, how did you do it? By what strength or might or power did you hold on to that handle? And what he said next was very simple. He said, I considered the alternative. <laughs> and that gave me the strength. <laughs> You see, we are amongst those that are fearful. But when you get right with God, you get to leave fear. Yeah. You see, fear, the Bible says, has to do with punishment. But perfect love drives out fear. Because we know what is waiting for us with God. Isn't it great to know that no matter what happens from here on forward in your life, if you are right with God, you get to go to heaven. Isn't that incredible? If you're afraid this morning and your greatest fear is you're not going to be successful, I got good news for you. You might not be. You might not ever have any money. You might not marry the person of your dreams. You might not start that business. And you might not get famous. But there's a lot of people that probably won't go to heaven. And yet God's given you. Wow the opportunity to do so. Maybe your, your greatest fear this morning is death. What are you afraid of death for? If you are right with God, do you understand that right now this is the hell for Christians? Your life doesn't truly begin until you die. This is the test. Death precedes the promised land. Paul says, he goes, well, I prefer to die by far because then I get to go and be with God. And he's not suicidal. That's not the issue. He goes, I know it is better that I remain in the body because that would mean fruitful labor with you. But what I prefer by far is to be with Christ in heaven. As Christians, we don't fear death. We anxiously await it, knowing that that is when our true life Begins. I may not have named your fear today, but with God, you don't need to have fear. You get to have faith. And that is a difference between a man or a woman of God and someone of the world. You know, unfortunately, we're going to be here for a while more. I don't look it, but uh, probably look a little older than that. About 40 years old. Wow. And by my calculations, now, I probably have a couple too many of these. <laughs> but my blood works pretty darn good. I don't have a six pack, but it could be worse. As you get older, it's not really about looking good anymore, it's about looking good for your age. You know what I mean? Doing good for your age. That's what it's all about. So I kind of am just calculating my head. I go, man, I think I've got at least another 40 years left. I got 40 more years. Some of you, you've just started. You're in your teens. And from a humanistic perspective, we go, wow, you're young. You must be fired up. As a Christian, if you're older, you should be fired up. I don't know who the oldest is here, and I would be very foolish to bring it up. 
Grab the Louis there in the back. Grandpa Louis should be more fired up than any of us. Why? Because he actually is closest to his reward. That being said, my point is this. We're going to have to hang out a little longer in this world. The challenge today is while we're in this world, let's not be of this world. Amen? Amen.